Well, while we're waiting, I, I'll use this opportunity to uh, uh, interview Leslie, who is <laughs> who has been an incredible champion and leader for our community and is sadly departing as executive director. I just want to ask you, Leslie, while we're waiting for Kevin to jump on, what's it, what's what are some highlights of your incredible term and, and leadership of this organization? Let's be at home. Oh my goodness, you know, um, I I I'm really surprised at where we've come. I, I really thought it, that uh, we would be a small little nonprofit and just scrappy and uh, and we've ended up uh, really growing. And, um, and I think uh, really some of the highlights have been our fundraising. I mean, we work together on Measure E. I heard this week uh, that the budget for Measure E next year maybe as high as $70 million, which if that's accurate is fabulous. Uh, and that in addition to measure A, which was a really big accomplishment back in 2016, uh, really is gonna help us uh, with our challenges. And so that was really, uh, I think that's definitely been a highlight. I mean, we've been really excited about our work uh, with North Bayshore. Uh, which is going to create about uh, 10,000 new homes in Mountain View, as well as our work in Deridon Station, which the council is set to uh, take action on later this month. Uh, and we're, we're very hopeful that there will be, um, you know, as many as 15,000 units in that area as well. And so those are, uh, those are a few uh, of the big things that we've worked on. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm really happy about our coalition building, what we've been able to do to bring different people together uh, in support of housing policy. Um, so uh, a lot of work yet to, yet to come. Sure, but thank you for leading the Measure E charge. Uh, I, as I recall, that was the only affordable housing measure that passed in the entire Bay Area that year. So thank you. Which yes. is, I guess it was just last year. It seems like it it's been a decade. We've been it, 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 I know it it's does feel like a long time ago, but uh, thank goodness <laughs> we got that in right before the uh, the pandemic closure. So, okay. hey, hey Kevin, everybody, uh, welcome. Uh, <laughs> hey, we're back. Just uh, you know, people were as we were getting on talking about having internet problems, and then I think it uh, jinxed my computer because. <laughs> I had to <laughs> run inside the house, but thank you guys all. Thanks, uh, Mayor Licardo and Leslie for uh, getting us started there. And thanks everybody for, for joining us for this event today. Um, welcome everyone to Silicon Valley at Homes Affordable Housing Month to our policy lunch series. And this is our kickoff event. Um, and really, really excited that everyone is here joining us. My name is Kevin Zwick. I'm the CEO of United Way Bay Area, um, and I'm also very proud to be one of uh, the founding board members and the current chair of Silicon Valley at Home. And uh, we're so excited to have you all here for Silicon Valley at Home's annual affordable housing month. Uh, this month is one of our uh, biggest affordable housing months ever. We have over 50 events and activities that highlight the important work that SV at Home and all of our community partners are doing on issues all across Santa Clara County. So this year's theme, Silicon Valley is home, is dedicated to our community. Um, you know, it's, it's dedicated to our community, whether or not it's families that have lived here for generations, us settling in, uh, Silicon Valley is where we live, and we want all of our neighbors to have access to a safe, stable, and affordable home. There's, and I want to say, you know, there's no better time to solidify your Hauser status and supporting this critical work uh, by then becoming a Silicon Valley at Home member, uh, and you can become a supporter at our website. Um, actually, we're going to be dropping a link in the chat. Uh, so how you can become a member and a supporter of affordable, of Silicon Valley at home. Uh, right now, we want to highlight all of the wonderful sponsors who make Affordable Housing Month possible. There we go. Here we go. We got the website. So thank you to our title sponsors, 
uh, Google and Microsoft and LinkedIn, and then all of the rest of our sponsors. We can't do this event and have the impact we need to have without all of you supporting this event. And we're super grateful for all of the sponsors listed here. So thank you. Uh, we also want to highlight several elected officials and their representatives who are joining us here today as well. Uh, we have with us uh, Alex Kobayashi from the office of Senator Josh Becker. Uh, we have Kevin Lee uh, from the office of Supervisor Otto Lee. Uh, we have Cassidy Cole from the office of San Jose Vice Mayor Chappie Jones. Uh, Helen Chapman from the office of San Jose Council Member Sergio Jimenez. We have uh, Gilroy Council Member Rebecca Armendariz. Uh, Mountain View Vice Mayor uh, Lucas Ramirez, and the City of Santa Clara's Council Member Kathy Watanabe. Um, and if there are any other elected officials or any other representatives we missed, thank you for joining us. Uh, and please let everyone in the chat uh, know that you're here with us today. So today we're thrilled to be kicking off Affordable Housing Month with an expert panel on the future of housing in Silicon Valley, uh, the opportunity of economic recovery. Our panelists are gonna be exploring the state of the housing market, what employers are thinking, how that might impact our housing needs and how we can shape our recovery to create more affordable housing and to protect families from displacement. Uh, this is part one of a three part series that's gonna continue at the exact same time next Friday when we'll have an expert panel talking about solutions on the cost of housing. Uh, the series is gonna conclude May 21st with a panel on innovative government solutions. So RSVP today through the SV at Home website. But before we get to our panel, we're gonna begin our program today with the presentation of the Santa Clara County Housing Champion Award to Blanca Alvarado and then a moment of remembrance in honor of Chuck Davidson. So with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Silicon Valley at Home Executive Director, Leslie Corsilia. Leslie. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Silicon Valley at Home is honored to give this year's Housing Champion Award to Blanca Alvarado. Many of you know Blanca. Some of you know her as panelist Teresa Alvarado's mom, uh, but for those who don't already know her, you need to know how important she has been to affordable housing in San Jose. Blanca was the first Latina to be elected to the city council in 1980. She served there for 14 years before she moved on to the board of supervisors where she represented San Jose's east side for 14 additional years. 28 years of service to the San Jose community as an elected official and many more as a member of our community. I met Blanca when I joined the city's housing department in January of 1991 as its first assistant director of housing. And I wouldn't have been appointed to that job if not for Blanca. She was the force behind the creation of the new department and prior to its formation, housing was spread out between several departments and the redevelopment agency, which managed the city's 20% low and moderate income housing fund was under scrutiny because it had not been focusing on affordable housing and particularly not housing for our low and moderate income families. Um, so um, the Blanca, um, she not only pushed for the creation of the department. She took on the mayor at that time, Mayor McHenry, who opposed uh, that move. And she uh, was able to, to uh, uh, create this the consolidated department through her efforts. She also chaired the mayor's task force on housing in 1987 and 88 that set goals that focused on lower income families and dispersed affordable housing throughout the community. And since that time, the housing department has built and rehabilitated over 20,000 new homes and helped thousands of families become new homeowners. So when in office, she championed housing, 
uh, including her support for the redevelopment of Poco Way, which I think is one of, of the things that she holds uh, very dear. Um, Poco Way had the distinction at the time of as being uh, uh, the number one crime neighborhood in the city. And now the revitalized neighborhood today is owned and managed by uh, the Santa Clara County Housing Authority and is a safe, attractive and affordable place for residents to live. More recently, Blanca has led the effort to close the Reed Hillview Airport, uh, which uh, will allow for mixed use development, uh, including housing. It's a tremendous area of opportunity for San Jose's east side, and it has the potential for thousands of new homes. We are very grateful for Blanca's work and her dedication to San Jose and to affordable housing. So Blanca, can you hold up the brick for people to see? Um, this, um, so we have an award, it's the Housing Champion Award. It was lovingly painted by Silicon Valley at home staff members. It is one of a kind, just like Blanca. And uh, we are just thrilled to be recognizing her today for all of her efforts. Blanca, do you wanna say a few words? Oops, off, take off mute. Leslie, that was such a wonderful trip down memory lane. We have done so much in Santa Clara County, you included. And I'm so grateful for all of your work at Silicon Valley at home. And I was disappointed to hear that you're on your way out, but you will always be in our hearts and grateful for all of your exceedingly good work on behalf of residents and homeowners and tenants in Santa Clara County. You know, going down uh, the lane uh, into the past was very uh, rewarding for me momentarily because I remember what a big political struggle we had at the city council when we took the housing money out of redevelopment and established our housing department. Part what I'm particularly grateful and remember with a great deal of love and affection is our introduction to our first housing director, Alex Sanchez. And as you know, you and Alex worked together to create momentum in the housing department and the leadership that was so vital at that time. But it was because of Alex, quite frankly, he had come from Santa Ana, if you will remember. And he was the one that showed me a model of a housing development that he had led in Santa Ana that led us to the opportunity to transform completely Poco Way. It was through Alex's intervention, his expertise in housing, his support for renovating Poco Way that allowed me to improve conditions in a neighborhood that was vastly underserving this tenants and its residents. But, you know, I was elected to represent a very needy district. And if it were not for people like you and Alex and a very supportive city council, we would not have accomplished as much as we did in those years. But also what I like to remember about the housing department is that we were the very first in district five to have the Habitat for Humanity uh, first sweat equity project on, on San Antonio. Um, so many things that we can look back with gratefully. And today, optimistically, with the kind of leadership that we have in Mayor Licardo, the Santa Clara community of, of leaders, we will address this daunting, daunting, a challenge of finding housing for families all throughout. Thank you again, Leslie, for a wonderful, wonderful experience. And with you, I would like to share my remembrances of Charlie Davidson, who was not only a great housing advocate, developer, a philanthropist, and he told wonderful stories. He was such a storyteller. And we've all missed Charlie uh, and know that there are like-minded people still uh, collaborating with people like you. 
to make San, San Jose and Santa Clara County the best in the world. Thank you again for all that you've done. And thank you for this incredibly heavy, but very <laughs> beautiful um, tribute. <laughs> Thank you, Blanca. Thank you. Uh, well deserved. Uh, you you really have have done wonderful things for this community, and and especially you know in my heart around affordable housing. So really, really appreciate everything that you've done. Thanks to all. Yeah, and if everybody could, they'd be clapping right now. But um, hard to do in um, in this format. <laughs> um, yeah. And thank you also for, for introducing uh, the next piece, which is a uh, tribute to uh, Chuck Davidson. Um, we really wanted to take this opportunity to, to honor Chuck. Uh, he was really a special person. He contributed greatly to our community and to our housing world. He left us at the age of 90, a couple of months back after a lifetime of success and generosity. Uh, and he was uh, giving back to the community even in his final days, and he has ensured that through his Davidson Family Foundation uh, that they will continue uh, to honor his giving philosophy into the future. Most people probably think of Chuck as a, as a real estate developer, um, and he's been a partner in L&D Construction, uh, in DKB, which was Davidson, Cavanaugh, and Brezzo, and more recently uh, DAL, Davidson, Areola, and Lazzarini. Um, but beginning in the 1970s, Chuck began to invest in affordable housing. He owned and managed hundreds, it may be thousands, I didn't go and count, but I'll say hundreds of affordable homes over the years. And he never once converted one of those homes to market rate despite being able to do that when the federal loans expired. Uh, and despite the fact that many people did that um, to, and, and got out of the affordable business. I did talk to him many times uh, about this and ensuring that he was gonna stay in and he always, uh, he always said he would and he always kept his word. Uh, every five years he had the opportunity to decide to, to sell and go out of the business, uh, but he did not. Uh, I was lucky enough to work with Chuck over the years. He was unassuming, he was gracious, and he truly believed in providing housing for Santa Clara County's lower income families. Uh, we, we, we lost a treasure. Uh, so thank you, Chuck, uh, for all you did. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, that was such a important way to honor Blanca's groundbreaking career and also to recognize Chuck's affordable housing legacy. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation to both of them. And now uh, we're very excited to present our panel discussion, the future of housing in Silicon Valley, the opportunity of economic recovery. Before we move into the panel discussion though, uh, we're very pleased to have Rachel Massaro, the Vice President and Director of Research for Joint Venture Silicon Valley, who's gonna help set the stage for us um, and for our panelists by presenting some analysis that Joint Venture has been doing on the intersection between the economic impacts of COVID-19 and our overarching housing crisis. So Rachel, uh, handing it over to you, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Again, my name is Rachel Massaro. I am Vice President and Director of Research at the Silicon Valley Institute for Regional Studies. For those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, we are the research arm of a nonprofit called Joint Venture Silicon Valley. It's been around since 1993 and exists to provide a framework for regional collaboration among our sectors in Silicon Valley. It also has a programmatic side of the house, which has a variety of initiatives going on at any given point in time. Now, among other things, the Institute creates the Silicon Valley Index. That's an annual publication that covers Silicon Valley's economic and community health trends across hundreds of indicators that we look at every single year. We are now in our 28th year of the Silicon Valley Index going into the 2022 index. 
This last report was our longest and most comprehensive ever, uh, due in no small part to the fact that, as we all know, the pandemic really affected every segment of our region's economic and community health. Trying to advance the slide here. Oh, there we go. So everything that's in our most recent report um, and more is online. We have this online data dashboard that we maintain for the public benefit. It has all sorts of data sets in there, downloadable data sets and links into resources and data sources online. Um, more recently, we have added these uh, real-time indicators, including earthquakes, wildfires, mobility, all sorts of stuff. Um, we do hope that you will utilize this website. Uh, we created it for the public benefit, and we hope that it gets used by our community. More recently, we've added a real-time COVID dashboard that daily updates the county um, COVID data, but um, aggregates it on the regional level. All right, well, when people think about Silicon Valley, they think about the world's most prodigious economy. And uh, certainly when you compare our region to all of these up and coming tech talent centers, you can see very clearly that in terms of the sheer number of tech jobs within our employment and the growth over time that we are continuing to stand out. Uh, now, for a place that only represents about 8% of the state's population and about 1% of the land area, we command a significant share of these economic drivers, including IPOs, uh, including patent registrations. We have most of the top patent generating cities, venture capital. And in fact, 2020 was a record year for venture capital in Silicon Valley in nominal values. Um, it was more venture capital than even the dot-com boom, with a lot of that money going into these very large mega deals. When we look at private companies with high valuations, there are these terms unicorns and decacorns. Now, decacorns are the ones valued at more than $10 billion. Uh, there are only 15 in the entire country right now. Seven of them are in San Francisco and two are in Silicon Valley. Now, we all know that in February and March of last year, the stock market began to decline and our region's public companies did lose market cap, but they rebounded and they did so well that they actually outperformed all of the other key market indices. And you can see in that chart on the right that now the aggregate regional market cap of all of our public companies is actually significantly higher than it was prior to the pandemic. And while those companies continue to do well, they also continued to hire. So here you see our employment picture in, sorry, losing control of the remote again here, um, in 2019. And typically about half of our uh, employment is in community infrastructure and services jobs. Those are things like retail, restaurants, healthcare, education, construction, nonprofit, stuff like that and about 25-26% uh, uh, tend to be in tech. That's in this light blue uh, piece of the pie right here. And you can see that between 2019 and 2020, because we lost those community infrastructure and services jobs, we gained them in tech. We actually changed the shape of our pie. I'll go, I'll go back again. You can see the change between 50%. Rachel? Rachel? Yeah. Um, you have control of the, of the screen. And so can you spotlight your video, please? I not I'm not sure how I can do that. It, it says I'm spotlighted. Okay, uh, we were just trying to do it from the back end, but I guess that's okay. Sorry about that. Um, so here we are with the 2020 employment picture and you can see that it's significantly changed from 2019. Um, while those companies continue to do well and continue to hire, they were also expanding their real estate footprint. So you can see here in 2020, there was an unprecedented amount of uh, commercial space under construction, primarily class A office space, but other types of space as well. Now, while our region's tech companies were doing well and the tech e economy was thriving, um, those of us who live here know that Silicon Valley is an actual place and that there is 
a lot more to the region than just tech, including our surroundings and including, of course, the people. Um, this was an interesting article that came out last week in the Washington Post about a photographer who came here to work with a Stanford professor aiming to capture real Silicon Valley people that were really struggling. And she notes that it was bizarre to her that Silicon Valley was a, a place that actual people lived and that the unease here was so palpable that she did a double take. She wasn't sure if she was really seeing things correctly. But those of us who live here know that uh, Silicon Valley residents do struggle and the pandemic made it worse. There was a point at which more than one in every three renters was not sure they were gonna make next month's rent or they had already deferred. We had hundreds of thousands of households that were at risk of eviction or mortgage non-payment. And in addition to all of the households that were already financially burdened by their housing costs, we had more specifically because of pandemic related job losses. So, a picture tells a thousand words, right? And what this says to me is that the cost of living is increasing and it's increasing, uh, the, the costs are increasing for food, they're increasing for housing, all sorts of things. There's one that I want to point out in particular though, which is the cost of childcare, which has risen more than twice at more than twice the rate of inflation over the past decade. And this is one of the major reasons why Silicon Valley families are struggling to get by. Now in the 1950s and 60s, there was this confluence of factors that enabled developers to build out quickly and affordably. There was the infrastructure in place and there was cheap land. And then here we are now and our housing costs are primarily because of the cost of land, not the house itself. This was a home that sold several years ago in Palo Alto, and it was not deemed fit for potential buyers to even visit, uh, uh, to even view on the inside, because it wasn't safe. Obviously, that near $2 million price tag was because of the land that that house was sitting on. So this is the environment in which we're in. Um, you can see the green line on the left there is indicating a rise in the share of the higher income households in our region. And on the right-hand side, you can see the, in, uh, the increase in the uh, inequality in our income distribution, which has risen over the past decade between 40 and 50% by what I would consider the best measures and is now at what is uh, likely an all-time high. But it's not just income, it's also wealth. And here we are with 16% of our households uh, holding 81% of the wealth. And meanwhile, one out of every five households has zero in savings or negative net assets, meaning that they owe money. So they don't have anything for a rainy day for a potential job loss, an unexpected bill, let alone going on vacation, saving up for their uh, child's college education, or of course, a down payment for a house. Uh, this is a related indicator um, that I won't dig in too deep into, but uh, that the ratio of privately held wealth to public capital has increased over time, and it's now more than 40 times greater than public capital. And this limits our local government's ability to be nimble and to invest in things like infrastructure that have been historically tied to economic mobility and distributive equity. These are a variety of different breakdowns of household self-sufficiency by characteristic. You can see it varies widely. But for instance, a household with a householder who's Latino, who's not a citizen, eight out of 10 of them are not able to make ends meet. Nearly three quarters of households with a single mother are not self-sufficient. That means they can't provide for their own basic needs without public or private informal assistance. And this was prior to the pandemic. So it has inevitably gotten worse. <clears throat> These are a couple of other trends I wanted to point out. Again, take a look at the green lines. We all know that people commute into Silicon Valley for jobs, but since 2011, which is the bottoming out of the housing market, 
um, that share has increased significantly. And in 2019, nearly 8% of all the commuters on our roads on weekdays were uh, driving more than three hours to and from work each day to work in Silicon Valley. And at the same time, our average household sizes were increasing. That's the number of people living in each household. So if Silicon Valley were a closed system, uh, then we would just figure out how many people live in households and then determine what we think is an appropriate household size. And we'd figure out how many units we need between, in this case, about 50 to 120,000 units. We build them and bada bing, bada boom, we have solved the problem and it's all done. Unfortunately, that's not exactly how it works. We all know that prices and availability and demand are all interrelated. And just because you build housing doesn't necessarily mean that it's adequate or where it needs to be or that it's affordable. Also, you have to take into consideration the fact that our population is continuing to change over time. You can see how our population is aging and we're losing population share of young people. Over the past year, our population growth rate was near zero. And it's due in no small part to the fact that our birth rate is lower than it has been at any other time in the past half century. We're also changing our region's composition in terms of the share of foreign born residents. Uh, this is the earliest we have on record regionally. It's 1870. We had 37% of our residents that were foreign born. That makes a lot of sense. Um, in the 1970s, because of particularly restrictive immigration policies, we were at our lowest at 9%. And you can see the growth over time um, is leading up to the highest on record in 2019 at 39% of our region's residents that are foreign born. Now the cultural shifts, in addition to primarily um, economic drivers, are leading to an increase in uh, multi-generational households. Uh, these could be uh, three-generation households, they could be grandparents living with grandchildren, and they can also be young adults living with a parent, and about one out of every three of them does. Median home sale prices have continued to increase since they bottomed out in 2011 um, into 2020. Part of the reason is because we are selling more homes at the higher price ranges than at the lower price ranges that's bringing up the median. These are some uh, longer term trends that I won't dig in too deeply into, but um, what I wanna point out here is that over time, we have been increasing the density of housing and newly approved uh, residential development, uh, more multifamily housing. And on the right hand side there, you can see the green line is uh, an increase over time in the share of those housing units that are being approved near transit or within walking distance to a major transit station. This is a chart showing the affordable units as a share of newly approved residential development. Um, in 2020, we had about 2,400 affordable units approved throughout the region. About 700 of them were for very low income households. And I don't think it's intuitive to most of us what low income means, what very low income means. So I wanted to point out what the hourly wages would be for two different types of households here, two income earners and a four person household or a single person living by themselves. And we can see that these hourly wages are a lot higher than minimum wage, even in the cities that have minimum wage ordinances with um, over $15 an hour. So there is a significant need for both low income and very low income housing. Again, this is kind of showing that the increase over time in the higher income households. And it is related to um, the, uh, the fact that the region overall is, um, has exceeded the regional housing need allocation in the higher income categories while not meeting them in the low and moderate income categories. Now we all know that home prices are high here um, and I want to point out that it's not just the price that is a barrier, but it's also the down payment. So when you look at the down payments and take into account the median household income, it becomes very clear that it takes a lot longer to save up for a down payment here than elsewhere. 
And by the time you've saved up your down payment, there's a good chance that prices have increased to such an extent that you can no longer afford the home to begin with. So this is a major hurdle to home ownership in our region. And when you look at home ownership by the sector, the industry sector that um, the householder works in, you can see that more than half of all tech workers own a home, whereas only 42% of those working in those community infrastructure and services jobs that we lost so many of during the pandemic, only 42% own a home. And when you break that down by racial and ethnic groups, you can see that it varies highly among them between about 25% and a 49% home ownership rate. These are just some trends to point out. I think it's interesting to note that back in 2018, Redfin came out with these hottest neighborhoods based on who was favoriting or visiting uh, listings on their platform. Nearly all of them were in the San Jose Metro. Uh, here we are in 2021 and people want to move places like Lake Tahoe and Big Bear and Mountain House away from the city centers. Likewise, on Zillow in 2018, uh, the hottest market was San Jose, and here we are in 2021 with the Sunbelt surge and a cooling of the market here. So I would pose this as an opportunity for our region. This hasn't happened in a long time. What can we do with a cooling market that can help enable uh, you know, progress for our own community? Um, and you know, there are a lot of ways to slice and dice housing data. We have lots at our fingertips um, and a lot of factors that go into, that come into play when making uh, regional decisions. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists about what's happening now and, and what the opportunities are for our future. And so with that, I, I'm gonna hand it back over to our hosts and say, thank you. Thank you, Rachel, for that really great overview. Um, I can't wait to dive into it. That slide that you put up around, uh, it's, for some people, it takes twice their annual income just for the down payment. I remember um, when, uh, when my parents were telling me to buy a home, you shouldn't buy a home that's more than three times your annual income. Now we're, it's getting to that just to, uh, just to get to a down payment. So it does show um, just how out of reach housing is for so many in our region. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think this has given our panelists a lot to reflect on, and I'm really going to briefly introduce them, and then we'll jump right in. But as a reminder to everybody watching us, um, please use the Q&A feature on the screen if you want to submit questions to the panelists. Um, we're going we're gonna to get to audience Q&A um, when we have about 15 minutes left in the program. So now I wanna, uh, I'm very, we're very, very lucky to have with us this great panel lineup, uh, people who bring expertise from across Silicon Valley's economy and the public policy world. So uh, joining us today is Kim Mike Cutler, uh, who's a partner with Initialized Capital, uh, Ahmad Thomas, the CEO of Silicon Valley Leadership Group, uh, Mayor of San Jose, Sam Licardo, and Teresa Alvarado, uh, the principal of Morado Consulting. So thank you guys all so much for being with us today. And uh, I'm gonna start with Ahmad. Um, given your unique perspective as, uh, as a CEO of Silicon Valley Leadership Group, uh, many of your member companies uh, have these large campuses that are usually bustling with employees and contractors, but have really been empty since the start of the pandemic um, as their workforces have been working remotely. Uh, but now that's changing with return to work and hybrid work. Um, what are the expectations you have around your members uh, reactivating their campuses um, or letting employees continue to work remotely? And then we're gonna be asking this of a lot of our panelists. Uh, what effect do you think these uh, hybrid work options are gonna have on our housing crisis? Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I, I feel bad going first on a panel that's as esteemed as this one. I don't know why, why you picked me, but I'll, I'll jump in and give it my best shot. I'll say that's really the operative question. You know, when we look at future of work, when we look at hybrid workforces, uh, what that's going to look like near term. It's something that we're in close touch with executives and our members about, trying to get a pulse of, of kind of the direction we're headed. Now, many of you probably saw what, what I saw in the Merck today about Google, one of the largest employers in Silicon Valley, one of our largest members 
announcing plans post COVID for employees to return to the office. I think it's interesting in answering that uh, maybe second question. I don't see remote work and the opportunity set it, it currently affords as having a, an impact related to the housing crisis or housing shortage that's appreciable. I think it's important from a business competitiveness standpoint. I think it's important where we look at uh, companies and where they choose to locate uh, versus Silicon Valley or California versus other high cost states. But I think beyond the anecdotal evidence, at least that I, I've seen, it's hard to see that be a real driver around the crisis that we currently face. But I do think for companies and our largest companies, there is going to be some element of remote work and a hybrid workforce that we see in the near term. And I think the companies that do that well will probably be most effective and most, uh, most potentially profitable. Uh, well, let me ask you a, a second question that's still dealing with the issue of um, employers and some of your members in housing. Um, over the past few years, uh, employers such as Google and Apple and LinkedIn and Cisco and then many others um, have been investing in housing, both in making direct financial commitments, uh, but also supporting and building housing as part of their campuses and their new developments. How do we make sure that keeps happening? And do you think there are any changes that these companies might have to make to that approach? Well, there are a few things I would say. I'd, I'd first make sure to give a shout out to uh, Mayor Licardo. If you look at the Downtown West project with Google, you know, you got a thousand plus affordable units for housing. When we look at the type of leadership that's required for massive investment, massive infrastructure like that to move forward, he's a great example of what I think we need to see more of. And also you have to give a shout out to Google, their executive team, they're making a decision to double down on our region and build and grow and invest here. I think for our companies from a policy standpoint, uh, common sense SQL reform is very important to us, which is uh, you know, SB7 in Sacramento. Beyond that, I'd like to see more creative thinking around how we can support impact investment, how we can bring more institutional capital in to solve problems like this. Uh, prior to my role here, I was an investment banker, as many of you know. I, I led the first social bond in the nonprofit uh, sector uh, for a uh, in the Bay Area and in the US municipal market. And what I saw for an entity that was in a pretty bad way, coming to market unrated, was a deal that was almost 10 times oversubscribed. And the clear takeaway for me is that there's far more capital out there, far more private capital out there than shovel ready projects or projects that will be ready in the near term to come online. So to me, where we can put more policies in place to support treasury functions, to support investment where private capital can be leveraged, uh, like you all do, like Destination Home does, that I think is the key to solving this crisis because there's just not enough public dollars uh, to get the job done. Well, great, thanks. Um, we'll hope to come back on some of these ideas around uh, impact investing and some of your expertise in, in that area. Um, but I, I do wanna move over to Mayor Sam Licardo. Um, going back to what Ahmad was talking about around hybrid work and, and um, the changes companies are considering around remote work, um, working from home or going back into the office, how does this affect local housing policy and more broadly, how does it impact San Jose? I think I agree with Ahmad that um, the impacts are not going to be quite as broad as has been broadcast in the media. Uh, you know, certainly those who are wealthy who have a lot of choices will be able to make those choices. Most of us won't. And um, <clears throat> you know, what I'm hearing from employers, and certainly the announcement from Google is is telling, is that. Uh, those who are in the creative industries uh, really rely on the innovation that comes with teams working together are going to continue to have smart, creative people working in the same buildings. Uh, they think there's value in that. I think, I, you know, I certainly see value in that as, as an employer as well. Uh, certainly, we will see more remote work than we had seen before the pandemic, but it's still going to be the case uh, that I think for most employers, uh, being having people, uh, teams working together, particularly across the silos, is going to be super important to continue to drive innovation. So I think we're going to continue to see a lot of the same patterns. The question is, can we take advantage of this recent disruption to perhaps find opportunities to get housing built, 
particularly affordable housing. Uh, and, you know, with a small reprieve for some of our renters, you know, how can we sustain that in some way to enable more of our young people, more of our families who are struggling to be able to afford to live here? Yeah, yeah. Um, Mayor Licardo, you know, we've, we've heard a lot of talk and fear of a Silicon Valley exodus of companies. Um, you've talked as well around how these, how just how high housing costs are threatening the economic viability of our region. Um, what do we need to do to, or adjust local policies in order to address these high housing costs or this supposed Silicon Valley exodus? Yeah, you know, the question whether or not there's an exodus is an interesting one. Um, I think it, that story is both overwrought and understated in different ways. I, you know, we're not seeing a grand exodus of companies. You know, I think the only two companies in San Jose announced they're moving their headquarters. I think it was, it was HPE and, um, and Align. Both of them are actually expanding their footprint with more workers here in San Jose. So, you know, they're not going anywhere. Maybe they're declaring for tax purposes or whatever that they're in some other state, but they're still here. Um, the, the, the bigger problem, the understated problem is that the housing costs have been killing us for a long time. And, you know, when, when Blanca Alvarado was a council member in San Jose before she was on the board, this was an expensive place to live in. And I heard a lot of complaints as a kid about how expensive, you know, it's only gotten worse. And, and we know this is the greatest challenge for economic vitality. And certainly it's, it's the most pressing problem for so many of our families who struggle every day here. Um, I, I think that, you know, Ahmad's point is a good one that there's just not enough public money. Um, I have supported taxes and I will continue to do so. And we have taxed ourselves enormously to try to create more public resources. You know, Leslie was talking at the beginning of the program about her leadership on Measure A, Measure E rather, the county on Measure A. A lot of great things have been done. There's still not nearly enough public money. At most, it'll build maybe 15% of our housing stock. We still have to rely on a market. Uh, and, and that means for governments, a big part of that is getting out of the way. Uh, we're not entitling enough housing. We're not enabling enough density to get built, particularly in a lot of the, the smaller towns in our region. Uh, there's still something of um, a, uh, a gated community uh, policy, uh, which they will happily accept large sprawling tech campuses, but higher density housing is largely excluded. You know, even in those communities where they have inclusionary programs, which we all you know want to see, uh, it doesn't really help much if they're not approving housing at a density that's gonna be relevant for families that are struggling. So, so really getting out of the way, enabling a lot of housing to happen, uh, looking at more innovative options because we, we know right now with, with the fall in rents, a lot of folks are sitting on the sidelines and sitting on their hands. They're not gonna start uh, big housing projects. Uh, we've seen vacancy rates now are in, in class A, for example, as high as 15 or 16%. So looking at more innovative options like backyard homes and ADUs, that was actually a third of our housing stock that we created last year was in backyard homes and ADUs. So we're gonna to have to continue to be nimble in that way and creating housing in unique ways. Uh, I think we're gonna be looking at densification of single family neighborhoods in, in a significant way, both in San Jose and, and elsewhere. Uh, and I would also say, you know, being more nimble around permitting and so forth, that's gonna be critical. It's obviously a longstanding problem. And, and I think we also have to have some pretty honest conversations about those of us who have been advocates for affordability around rent control and what that may do to the willingness of the private market to actually invest. And, and certainly anyone can point the finger at me because I voted for and supported a tightening of rent control here in San Jose. But I have heard from multiple investors uh, who are talking to developers who are saying, hey, we're not that interested in California because we're pretty convinced the legislature at any time is gonna start to change the laws and make it even more restrictive on rent control, which means it doesn't make sense for us to invest. And so we need to recognize that this market rate development is actually super important. And it's important for ways that we may not appreciate immediately because we don't have enough public resources to build all the housing supply we need. In fact, only a small fraction of it. Uh, we need that, that private market to actually build and generate the fees that we have in our inclusionary programs, such as in San Jose, where 15% of the units have to be affordable. And, and also we have to contain what I call the rent contagion, which is that contagion of, of, of not building enough new housing that is forcing the employees at Google uh, and Apple and all these other great companies to go to our older housing stock and drive up rents there. 
which is making it more expensive for everybody. So we've got to do both. We need the affordable housing and, and the public investment, but we've got to do more to enable the market to get built. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's this, always this balance between uh, needing to build more housing for everyone while recognizing that the market doesn't build housing for people who are at, uh, you know, who, who make just a living wage or uh, folks who don't make $100,000 or more, the market doesn't produce that. So yeah, I, I really appreciate the, the, um, the balancing act that we have to meet in our housing policies while also centering the perspectives of people who have lived here for a long time and uh, want to live here and want their kids to be able to live here and um, not being priced out of, out, of, out of their housing when the rental market comes back. So um, definitely, a, definitely a challenge to meet all of those uh, different goals. Um, Kim, I want to turn this over to you. Uh, you've been very prolific in your writing and speaking about how the Bay Area's tech economy is intertwined with our housing crisis and, you know, especially placing our current situation in a historic context. What's your outlook right now on the tech industry and uh, how that's going to change and rebound as we come out of COVID? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's really a story of a lot of companies from early stage to later stage to public companies I have learned over the course of the pandemic that they can hire and manage teams that are coming from anywhere. Um, you know, this is a trend that we saw even prior to the pandemic. Um, you know, in our first couple of funds or first two funds um, starting, you know, seven and 10 years ago or so, you know, I would say like 60 to 75% of those companies were based in the Bay Area. Um, and if I look at our more recent funds, it's below 50% now. Um, and that's just a factor of, yeah, I mean, some of it's, you know, like pre-pandemic, it was, it was definitely more of a cost issue in that earlier stage companies couldn't really compete with the salaries and comp and costs of operations in the Bay Area. Um, you know, we're an early stage fund, so we invest at the seed stage when it's like a couple founders and maybe a couple of employees. Um, so I think, you know, when you look at numbers, like there's a lot of people quoting like venture funding numbers, like venture capital is still concentrated in the Bay Area. But I think it's really important to remember that those are somewhat backwards looking numbers and that the biggest rounds are for growth stage companies that were founded five to 10 years ago. And what you want to look at is the next seed crop of companies and where those are. So I do, I do think that something that is different this time is when we've seen companies companies leave the Bay Area. It's historically been older companies um, like your, you know, like your HPs of the world or oracles or whatever. Um, I do think it's interesting that some of the younger companies like Stripe and Coinbase, um, you know, decided to go remote or, you know, Stripe prior to the pandemic moved its headquarters from San Francisco to South San Francisco. And then later it decided to start to actually pay employees to leave high cost regions like the Bay Area and, and Seattle. And that's something I've never seen before. I've never seen young, high growth, high valuation um, companies like actively move their employees out of the region. That's typically been like an older company thing to do. Um, and then I also think, you know, the Google announcement reflects, you know, that, that you know, the way that companies are going to operate their workplaces, whether remote or hybrid, is going to be a dynamic process that you know, reflects push and pull between like worker preferences and the employer preferences. And clearly in Google saying like, hey, you know, this large percentage of our company can work permanently remotely is saying like, that's reflecting that the employees are demanding that because, you know, there's just the cost of living doesn't, doesn't really make sense here. And, you know, I think, you know, someone who grew up here and then has this, I've spent most of my life here. I've just kind of watched, you know, the housing needs change through the life cycles of my peers. And it's like, you know, now I'm in my thirties and people are having kids and like the cost of childcare plus, um, you know, finding a family sized home is, it's just, I mean, it's basically kind of like a luxury good right now in the Bay area. And, and what, uh, you know, what's, what's frustrating from like a macro perspective is like, you know, if you look at the median home price of a home in California has now reached three quarters of a million dollars across the whole entire state. And, you know, I've been involved in like housing production policy advocacy for so many years at this point. And, you know, I think, you know, the state started with some really crazy ambitious bills, like, you know, Scott Wiener wanted to do multiple stories near transit lines two or three years ago, but the state legislature didn't vote for that. And now we have Tony Atkins bill, which is much more modest and is about like 
duplexes and the state's Democratic Party, you know, where every, you know, like the assembly and the Senate voted for it last year, but the state's Democratic Party couldn't even like have a position on duplexes at a time, you know, when we're seeing the prices that we're seeing is really disheartening and disappointing. And then also, you know, to add to that, there's also the eviction moratorium is expiring soon, so we don't know what the full implications or ramifications of that are. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. And it, it, just given everything you've talked about, what, what do you think our governor and legislature should prioritize in order to address, I mean, you know, I think, housing needs? I mean, I, you know, I respect like what Tony is trying to do, but I would say that like Gavin ran on a promise that he was going to try and build 3.5 million homes by like a couple years from now. And he's really not, you know, obviously a pandemic happened, but he clearly hasn't expended you know, much visible political capital on this particular part of the issue. I, I do praise him for project, you know, like the, the like project, is it home key or room key? Um, you, you know what I'm talking about? Like that, that, that was both. Yeah. <laughs> room yeah. key, then home key. That was yeah. great. Um, but like on the production side, we're not really seeing real, him really expend, you know, taking a lot of political risk there. Yeah. Which is unfortunate, which he promised to do, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sure our panelists, also have a lot of ideas of what they think the governor and legis legislature should do first, but uh, let's, let me get through, let me ask a few more questions and then we'll come back to that since um, I, I'm really interested to hear what, what other people think too should be top of the list. And actually we'll have a whole um, another um, uh, uh, lunch policy forum on this um, later on. So, but um, I want to talk about the Silicon Valley Recovery Roundtable. Now it's known as the Building Back Better initiative that's overseen by joint venture Silicon Valley. Um, they developed a work plan of interconnected policies to address the region's economic recovery, including a lot of housing recommendations. Um, Teresa, as one of the core members of the Recovery Roundtable and co-chair of its Inclusive Recovery Subcommittee, um, how do you see policymakers now operationalizing some of these recommendations and incorporating them into our recovery efforts? Uh, it looks like you're on mute, Teresa. <laughs> I'm trying to use my phone because I was having trouble. Oh, we lost you again. Okay, how about that? There we go. So I have both the computer and the phone. So if you hear echoing, please let me know. I apologize for that. Um, but I just wanted to first uh, recognize and thank Mayor Ricardo who convened the Silicon Valley Recovery Roundtable. And it was co-chaired by leaders in tech and labor and philanthropy. It was supported by the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, by Boston Consulting Group and Stanford Impact Lab. So 59 cross-sector members rolled up their sleeves we had scores of meetings in a three month period. We published a report in 100 days in August of last year. People can find it at siliconvalleystrong.org. So we centered our work squarely on the reality that COVID-19 disproportionately impacted the most vulnerable communities, people of color and undocumented people as Rachel referenced, really reflecting the reality that the pandemic exacerbated existing systemic inequities and racial injustices. People of color and undocumented workers represent the bulk of the essential workforce, occupying the front lines of the pandemic with the least likely to have access to basic medical services or sick leave if they did somehow manage to continue to have a job. So living conditions, you know, make them more vulnerable to becoming infected and spreading the virus to others in their households. And most had no safety net to enable them to ride out the pandemic. So the process was intensive. It was very collaborative. I think people were really excited about what we were accomplishing. You know, we had folks at the table who aren't usually working together to address these underlying structural issues in the region. But the end of, at the end of our 100-day process, we were left with the same issue of fragmentation that plagues progress on so many policy and planning issues in our region. And I really think that was our biggest missed opportunity taking the momentum that we had and transitioning into a phase of commitments and building the essential framework to address the problems that have plagued our region and only widen the disparities in our population would have been an incredible opportunity. 
thankfully, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation did not let the momentum die, and they've worked with the co-conveners and, and co-chairs and some of us who were very active on the process to plan the road ahead. So Nicole, she's the co-chair now of Joint Venture Silicon Valley, and she's worked with their team to think about how they can both continue to track and report on the metrics that we included in the Silicon Valley Recovery Roundtable report through the index report that Rachel puts out every year, and then also drive the collective regional commitment and action to its implementation. So I think that is really what's clear, um, Kevin, is this idea of operationalizing. How do you operationalize collaboration? How do you operationalize a collective commitment and get people to follow through on those commitments without the you know, authority to do so? Um, I think we have a responsibility to one another in this valley to not allow these you know, these conditions that have been laid bare by COVID to continue, we have to not allow ourselves get distracted by economic recovery that seems to have been very robust in some sectors and continue to stay in this conversation and to be in partnership with one another, uh, with one another on behalf of those who do so much to sustain each of us every day. Yeah, well, I like um, what you were saying at the beginning um, around uh, the the viewpoints that you brought and 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 centered in the conversation was yeah. who are the most vulnerable in our community, uh, communities of color, people who are on the front line. So how do we how do we continue to center racial equality um, and the need to provide opportunities that that you know. Um, that continue to center the needs of, of those most affected in, in this and in other economic recovery efforts? Yeah, you know, we, we started every meeting with stories uh, from interviews that we conducted with people who've been affected by the pandemic. We wanted to make sure that that was front of mind in all of our conversations. And I think that's an important practice for all of us to continue. It's kind of like a land acknowledgement, right? Recognizing um, who's been uh, affected and who, who's, uh, on whose backs we are uh, being able to succeed and thrive. So that was really important. At the um, Inclusive Recovery Subcommittee, we really zeroed in on four main challenges that residents have faced, loss of income, inability to pay rent, limited access to financial tools and services, and lack of a sufficient social safety net. Um, so I really want to just acknowledge also the response of our public sector leaders. You guys talked about Project Home Key and, and other things. Um, our public sector leaders, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation and corporate leaders really stepped up immediately and created the Silicon Valley Strong platform to raise money and recruit volunteers. And thanks to their efforts, 3,800 people have been permanently housed in our county, and the effort raised $36 million in rental and direct financial assistance that went to 15,000 households in need. That assistance, along with eviction moratoria, has meant that people have been able to stay in their homes. It's, it's absolutely an important part of the message. But also, the nonprofit community needs to be heralded. heralded. I think they've been absolutely heroic in not only reacting, but in doing so in an incredibly coordinated and cooperative way. They are the experts. They should be celebrated by our public and private sector leaders for working day in and day out to lift up the experiences and respond to the needs of our community's most vulnerable. So all the issues that we talked about, you know, uh, ELI households lost two thirds of their income during the pandemic. And disproportionately higher death rates and unemployment rates have de devastated some neighborhoods, including my zip code of 95116, which is, you know, really at the heart of the pandemic um, and what has happened. So, again, now as we're opening the economy up, how do we make sure that we're centering the fact that we still are relying on these essential workers who are there providing service to us? And I think uh, any and all efforts that we can to create more extremely low income. Uh, and low-income housing that uh, Rachel mentioned, we need to look at all of our policies, all of our practices, whether we're public sector or private sector, and how can we reflect on the systemic racism and classism that creates the disproportionate opportunities and outcomes, and how are we each going to dismantle those barriers that have created those deep and inhumane inequities? 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, the, you know, in my day job at United Way Bay Area, uh, we're increasingly focused on housing instability as a root cause of poverty and the, the systemic, you know, um, the systems that, that have made that and put that into place. And so we recognize that a safe place to call home is essential for creating stability and building towards prosperity. Um, Rachel, I kind of want to just bring you back in to this too. I mean, coming back to your research and that analysis you presented earlier, can you expand on what insights you gained on the relationship between poverty and housing instability? Well, like you said, stability. Um, and also when you're renting, you don't have that, that um, idea of what your rent might be next year or next month, um, there's a chance that you might not be able to pay it at any given point in time. And that stability of knowing that you can afford your housing is incredibly impactful. But um, there are a few points that I would probably want to make. I mean, one is that when we look at the self-sufficiency standard data, we can see very clearly that, you know, it, it's not that people have a pot of money of their income that's just dedicated to housing. I mean, People are making hard choices at, between spending money on housing or on transportation or on childcare or on food. There's no, you know, easy, well, you have this money for housing, you spend it. Um, it's all interrelated and you have to have enough for all of your basic needs. And so it's a, it's a much more complicated picture than just having enough money for housing. Um, it, another point is that our region doesn't really have a lot of affordable housing to own. Um, really, when you look at it, when we talk about affordable housing, we tend to be talking about rental units. Um, and any of the um, homes to own that are less than, say, $400,000 are mobile homes. Um, and there are, there are a limited number of those. So that is an issue when we're talking about um, home ownership as a, an opportunity not only to have stability, but also to help um, gain a, a, an opportunity to build wealth, to, to build equity. Um, it's really important for us to have affordable housing that's available to own, um, it, particularly in a place like Silicon Valley, where if you don't have money to set aside for retirement and you know, home values have been increasing at a higher rate than retirement investments have. And so, so if, if, you're, if your main retirement um, pot is from owning your home, then the people who own homes here will be able to retire and the people who don't own homes won't be able to. And we've seen this very alarming and increasing trend toward uh, people over age 55 who are um, going back into the labor force or staying in the labor force longer, unable to retire because they don't have um, the ability to pay for housing. They don't have a house they've paid off. Great. Uh, thanks. I, I, I wanted to come back to the question that I asked Kim earlier and sort of pose it to um, any of the panelists. Um, and like I said, we're going to be digging into this question more in the third event of the series, which is going to be focused on innovative government actions. But I wanted to ask, you know, you all as well, um, what bold ideas are you following from our state and federal leaders that we should lift up um, to address Silicon Valley's housing needs? Or if you can't find one that's bold enough or the right one, what would you suggest? Um, who, who, who would like to answer that? So Mayor Licardo, you want to start us off? Smart people in this valley have been working on a lot of really great ideas. Um, so let me just start with a couple. First, kudos to Jennifer Loving uh, a couple of years ago for pushing the city and the county to recognize that if you want to do something about homelessness, and although we can all talk about the thousands of people we've housed over the last several years who have been living on our streets, um, the reality is we know people are getting pushed out at a higher rate than we're able to house them. And if we don't do something about homelessness prevention, um, well, we, we know what the, the outcome is gonna be. So, you know, as, as horrible as the, the homelessness epidemic has been in our region, and let's face it, it's horrible in, in just about every big city in the West, um, what we are learning is uh, some lessons around how we can be much more effective at reducing human misery and being more cost-effective by getting to families before they're evicted. Uh, with simple amounts, you know, 
four to five thousand dollars per family is what we've seen in, in in our programs up until the pandemic when we were seeing these families as they were about to get their notice of eviction a year later they were saying staying sta stably housed because what they needed was just that bridge funding to be able to get past the loss of the job or the health episode, whatever it might've been that has been pushing so many people out. And we know there's a lot of different factors pushing people out of their home. So A, I'd say a very simple innovation was, and, and that we've really now, and, and Teresa talked a little bit about this, the Silicon Valley Strong Fund, we, we took that program and basically expanded it dramatically um, because we think that simply giving people the choice uh, of how to spend the dollars is much more effective than the government telling them how to do it. And uh, we can do it fairly cost effectively. A couple other innovations I'll just mention very briefly. One, uh, and I know you know about this, Kevin, because we recently hit you up for money on this. <laughs> but you know, we are finding that we can build uh, housing more cost effectively using uh, a lot of more innovative techniques that are around prefabricated and modular construction. Um, and we can do it much more quickly. And for homeless emergency and transitional housing, as we discovered through this pandemic, you know, rather than taking four or five years to build an apartment complex that would cost $700,000 per unit, um, we can do it with prefab modular uh, at you know, maybe $115,000 or $110,000 a unit and do it in four or five months. And so we've built three of these projects already. We'll have a fourth, hopefully under construction this summer. That's not the solution for everyone, obviously, but for an awful lot of our housed, uh, that's gonna be a critical way for us to expand housing supply, I think. Uh, and the last thing I'd just say is also something you worked on in your last job, uh, Kevin, when you're heading up the housing trust. Uh, I think being able to crack the nut about how we can help homeowners build uh, backyard homes and ADUs that could be rent restricted and affordable. Uh, if we can help them figure out the financing problems around that, I think that has extraordinary potential in a, in a region where most of our parcels, sadly, are single family and they're going to remain that way for a century. So let's find a way uh, to help folks build more housing on those sites. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Sam. Um, you know, a lot of the ideas out there aren't actually bold or straight. It's just like, get people to do the basic stuff that we've been talking about for, you know, 20 or 30 years. And like, I mean, I, yeah, I was at, you know, a company that we invested in called Ubodu. I mean, they can do backyard prefab ADUs. And if you buy them off the shelf and you don't want any, any customization to it, they can do it in, in as little as 30 days. And so like, just need people to let, you know, we need other cities to make it easy for us to do that because we can deliver it. Um, and, you know, Sam was the first, um, you know, we went, he, we were the first unit like uh, almost a year ago and we've done them all over the state. Now we're doing them both in um, Seattle and now, now in Southern California. So we, I mean, we can do it. We just have to be allowed to do it. Um, and then there's also this other component of just, you know, obviously, you know, through the pandemic, um, it's mostly been um, primary homeowners using it for like moving elderly loved ones or kids back in. But like over time, it would be great to just do the basic education, like figuring out what, like not just constructing financing programs, but also like just making more homeowners aware of them that, um, you know, the costs of uh, like a HELOC are actually not that, it's not really that expensive. And then you can actually provide, you know, a rental unit at a much lower, you know, monthly rental rate than like a standard mid-rise, like new rental building um, with these backyard units. Um, and we're also, um, we also do, you know, I, I, we're also investors in a company called Landed that does down payment assistance. And so we're actually, they actually do down payment assistance for like nurses, healthcare workers. They partner with, like they just partnered with California State University. So it's available to San Jose State, you know, um, uh, um, employees. Um, and we can do that. But, uh, you know, the problem on the other side is the spring has, you know, pointed out is there's no inventory. We're at the lowest inventory level since like the 1970s. And so like we can provide solutions on the private sector side, but we really like we really need the public sector and, uh, and communities, including, you know, the other suburban communities that you haven't named, but we all know who they are, um, that, you know, just to do the basic work of, you know, building and providing more inventory and enabling it. And these aren't bold ideas. They're obvious ideas. Um, and it's just frustrating that it just takes so many years and decades to make them happen. 
Yeah, Kevin, I would piggyback on everything Kamai and uh, the mayor have shared here and maybe talking out of turn a little bit, present company obviously excluded. We've talked about a lot of great innovation and ideas. Uh, I don't look to the public sector to drive uh, bold innovation on the scale that's needed to solve these types of problems. My bias is always to view uh, private sector and technology first and try to support those advances via public sector and via policies. Uh, Factory OS is another company. We spotlighted them at an event a couple weeks ago where they can lower, uh, reduce the cost of getting units up by 20 to 40 uh, percent. And they can put 100 units up in less than a week and a half, right? And they're a Facebook backed company. And I think it's those types of, it's the private enterprise. And I think that type of investment where I see the future is uh, from the production side. But I also want to touch on what keeps me up at night, you know, when, when we hear from, uh, from the mayor and others about production. You know, I look at construction cost inflation. Some of you, if you've looked at uh, steel and commodities prices, which are starting to go through the roof, we're in a very low interest rate environment right now, which provides a good opportunity to finance the types of projects we're talking about or for low interest loans to be leveraged to, to help solve this problem. But we are in an inflection point and we have a unique set of circumstances. And what concerns me is that if we're not able to act and mobilize now in a different interest rate environment, in a different economic environment, it's really not that easy to finance and get the production goals that we need to see. And you know, if you look at the Google, uh, Apple's, Facebooks of the world, they've made, uh, I think, amazing contributions in our region uh, monetarily and putting their weight behind what we're doing. But to leverage those investments to the maximum amount possible, you need an interest rate environment that supports it, and you need a cost of construction that aligns with getting the units up at a reasonable price. And I fear that those dynamics aren't, uh, aren't moving in the right direction. Teresa, do you want to uh, jump in here on this question around uh, what bold ideas you'd like to see from the state or federal government? Uh, Meet it again. Yep. Yeah. Like we need the phone. I was using the phone, but I'm going <laughs> to. Oh, no. I'm going to hit the phone again. Wow, I have to do both simultaneously. That is strange. I've never had this. Sorry, everyone. Um, I want to go back to the public sector just quickly. Um, current zoning laws uh, that favor single family homes, known as exclusionary zoning have disproportionately hurt low-income Americans, and many of them can't afford to buy a big lot of land, leaving them trapped in their neighborhoods, and, and really has been a, ex very exclusive to black and brown uh, residents. Biden's infrastructure proposal would actually award grants and tax credits to cities that change zoning laws to bolster more equitable access to affordable housing. And so the city of San Jose has a great opportunity housing proposal that it's going to consider in the coming months. I think it's really important to have the conversation about that because creating more housing units in higher resource neighborhoods leads to more opportunities in life, better education, access to parks, safer neighborhoods. So I think that's really critical. The other part of Biden's plan that I think is so exciting is this uh, innovation of social infrastructure and investing in things like childcare, as Rachel talked about earlier, which is critical to helping women get back in the workforce because we're seeing this uh, you know, dramatic she session and, um, and, and the lowest numbers of women in the workforce since the 80s. So I think those are both innovations that are going to be at scale and could uh, really transform how, we, uh, how we're able to access the workforce and housing. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, I was looking at the, some of the questions that um, our attendees have uh, dropped in the Q&A box. Um, one is from uh, Lucas Ramirez, uh, who, we, I, who we acknowledged earlier as one of our elected officials uh, as our attendee, and he asked about opportunity housing. Um, are, does anybody have any thoughts on how providing more housing density in existing single family neighborhoods could contribute to economic recovery? I'll just say, I think Teresa's right uh, that it's absolutely worth, and it will be, I know heavily debated and discussed in San Jose uh, as it has been in other big cities. Um, 
I expect, um, let me just say this. I, I, I think it makes a lot of sense for us to be looking at upzoning single family housing in lots of parts of the city where you have a commercial corridor, we have transit nearby. Um, my own personal view is it makes a lot less sense as we get further and further from basic services and transit uh, because I, I think the environmental impacts over some time start to outweigh the, those benefits. Um, so I, I think we need to think more critically as well about, I mean, where you can really get significant densities and a lot of sites where cities are simply not allowing, you know, the 100 units or 200 units an acre they could get uh, because they're going to put a, a ceiling at two or three stories. I think those are the bigger lost opportunities because I don't believe, based on what we've seen so far in other cities that have tried this, that you're going to suddenly get a whole bunch of homeowners are going to say, I want to turn my home into a, a fourplex. Uh, let's do one other question that came in through Facebook. Um, somebody writes that they noticed that rent prices have dropped. Um, will low income affordable rent apartments also drop to reflect this trend? I think what they're saying is, yeah. you know, um, one, of, one of the features of what's been happening is that rent prices um, have seemed to stabilize and drop some overall. Is that going to, people think that this is going to continue? Will it reflect? And, and will it drop low enough that uh, lower income workers will see any benefit from uh, and be able to afford um, rents? I could jump in just briefly on this. Our experience is, not, is that we are not seeing significant rent relief for the families who need it the most. Um, the, the rent drops are really in the high end uh, and the market rate. Um, the affordable Rent restricted homes, all that's being driven mostly by federal formulas and so forth that have to do more with incomes. So the market drops are only benefiting at the highest end. Uh, and that should be a serious concern for all of us because they also have the impact of reducing incentives for market rate builders to go build. Kevin, that's in line if you go to a higher level at the economic, uh, looking at the economic data that we see, right? A, a V or a K-shaped recovery uh, likely on track, meaning for those that are in white collar roles that are doing well, you know, many of our companies in Silicon Valley, we've been very blessed to be able to uh, continue to generate revenue and be very profitable through the pandemic. Whereas those in service jobs, so many of those uh, working class individuals we've talked about today really seem to struggle. And I think that's why what we've talked about is so important. But I would note beyond that, that one thing that gives me great hope is the fact that the tenor of this discussion is changing, right? When you heard Teresa talk about uh, lived experience and how important equity uh, is and having voices at the table contribute to the discussion and provide solutions, I think that is very different than what I've seen you know, observing this for the last 15, 20 years. Now, how we operationalize that, the question you asked is, is uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road, but I do think that there are a lot of steps that are positive related to dialogue and putting forth solutions that are much more inclusive than they've been in the past. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad, for that. I think we're going to end this here. Uh, that's a good note to end it on. So I really want to thank all of our panelists for this excellent discussion, Ahmad, Mayor Licardo, Kim, Teresa. Um, and I also want to thank Rachel for that great presentation as well. Um, there's so much for us to work on, but I'm really encouraged that, you know, together we can leverage the opportunities of our economic recovery and, and create that more equitable society that we were talking about where people of all backgrounds and incomes and abilities um, can continue to stay in Silicon Valley and find a home in the Silicon Valley. Um, so we're looking forward to continuing this series next Friday, May 14th, also at one o'clock. Um, and we're going to do a deep dive into the cost of housing development and innovative ways to address this challenge. Um, we heard from some of our panelists today that that's things that uh, folks are investing in um, and cities are really interested in as well. So uh, that's a hot topic. And then for the full calendar of Affordable Housing Month events, uh, please check out the SV at Home website. Um, which I think we're going to paste in the chat box again um, for everyone to see. And, and, you know, I wouldn't be a good uh, chair of the SV at Home board if I didn't also 
encourage everybody here to become a member of Silicon Valley at home. Uh, we'd love for you personally and uh, for your organizations to uh, become members and be part of the broad coalition that's pushing for a more equitable, uh, e equitable region um, when it comes to our housing. So, but before we go, um, I want to say one last thank you to our sponsors. Um, and I want to give them a chance uh, for us to hear from them why they support affordable housing and why they support Affordable Housing Month. And I think we have a video for that. So uh, let's, let's play that video. There's no sound. We love you, Michelle and Gina. Passionate about advocating for housing because it is critical to both our collective and individual success. We need local housing solutions so we can generate broad-based economic growth, reduce commutes, and generate prosperity for everyone. For me personally, if the average life expectancy for individuals experiencing homelessness is 25 years less than for people who are stably housed. This statistic is one of the reasons the Health Trust prioritizes health and housing. Until we fix the housing instability that so many in our communities face, we will not have a community that is sustainable in the future, where we all want to live, one that is whole. I am passionate about advocating for housing because it is critical to both our collective and individual success. We need local housing solutions so we can generate broad-based economic growth, reduce commutes, and generate prosperity for everyone. For me personally, and for the work we're doing at Urban Catalyst, providing more housing solutions for all levels of income is vital to the success of the community. Hi, my name is Lenny Scutierrez, and I work for Comcast. We are excited to be sponsors for the first time of SB at Homes Affordable Housing Month. We know how important it is for there to be affordable housing, and just importantly, how important it is to have affordable broadband at home. I am hopeful that we can solve housing instability because working at Destination Home, I see the passion and drive of my colleagues and partners every single day. As part of our Housing Ready Communities work, I see clear and abundant desire among neighbors and community members to help learn and get involved. Hi, I'm Patty with Habitat for Humanity, East Bay, Silicon Valley. And yes, I feel hopeful even in the midst of this housing crisis, a community of engaged, impassioned uh, people that are, are willing to do something about affordable housing can have that kind of impact. A health net we believe every person deserves a safety net for their health regardless of age, income, employment status, or current state of health. We understand how important housing is to the health of an individual, especially for one's physical and mental health. And that's why we're excited to be sponsors for this year's SV at Home Affordable Housing Month. Great, thank you. Forward supports expanding the supply of housing that's really affordable to low and moderate income residents. We do that because it helps equity, the environment, and the economy. Hi, I'm Candace Gonzalez. On behalf of Sand Hill Property Company, we are happy to support SV at Home's Affordable Housing Month. We believe that housing should be a right, and we believe in housing for all. At Applied Materials, we believe that everyone deserves access to safe and affordable housing. But we know that this simply isn't the reality right now in our community. Through activities and engagement like Affordable Housing Month, individuals in our community have the opportunity to dive deeper into the issues that cause the inequities in Silicon Valley, as well as really focus on the solutions. Well, Facebook's have been in the housing space for several years now. Uh, in 2019, we made our billion dollar commitment 
to increase housing affordability and launched our first fund out of that commitment. I want to thank SD at Home for putting on uh, such a stellar lineup again this year. I'm really looking forward to the events and the critical conversations that we need to have about how to increase housing opportunity for all. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, we invite you to participate in our video collection project as well and share why affordable housing is critical and important to you, too. Um, the link is being shared in the chat. and We invite you to pick one of the questions and uh, record your insights, reactions, and perspective with us. Uh, it's very easy to do. Um, and then we'd love to hear everybody's voices that we can uh, be a part of this project for affordable housing month. So thank you again to everyone who, uh, who who's attending today, who presented today. And I wanna give a quick shout out to the great Silicon Valley at Home staff, uh, David, Gabby and Melinda and others for their work putting on this event today. Um, and if you wanna join the Silicon Valley at Home team, I know we're recruiting right now for a preservation and protection associate. Um, so check out the website careers page. And with that, Thank you um, and have a good affordable housing month.